everyone, it's Dr. Morales here. Uh, thank you for checking out this video. I'm very excited to present to you this interview today. I'm gonna be interviewing Dr. Joseph Cranin. He is board certified in neurology as well as sleep medicine. He's also the founder of Singular Sleep, which offers at-home sleep apnea testing. And we're gonna talk all about sleep apnea and AFib as well as the benefits of at-home sleep apnea testing. Dr. Cranin, thank you for joining me today. How are you doing today? It's my pleasure. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Dr. Morales. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for taking a few minutes out of your time to be here and talk to my audience over here at Dr. AFib about just the importance of AFib and the association with sleep apnea. Uh, obviously, you're an expert in sleep apnea as well as a AFib in relation to sleep. So for those, many of my audience kind of knows a little bit about the association between sleep apnea and AFib, but why don't you start off by just kind of telling people about just the prevalence of of sleep apnea and AFib together and sort of what you see every day when you're kind of practicing how common you're seeing AFib and sleep apnea together. So I like to tell my patients that AFib and sleep apnea go together like peas and carrots. Mm. They're really tightly linked. So the estimates in the research vary, but one of the best studies showed about a 50% association. So mm -hmm. half people of people with AFib will have obstructive sleep apnea when tested. And what we know is that it seems to be a causative link with the obstructive sleep apnea contributing to causing the atrial fibrillation if it's not treated mm -hmm. over time. The, the main mechanism seems to be the oxygen drops that you can get all night long from the obstructive sleep apnea it seems to cause changes in the heart or the heart can misfire and lead mm -hmm. to this irregular heart rhythm. What we definitely know too, what's really clear is that people with AFib don't often stay out of it. If they've had an ablation, mm -hmm. the ablation is much more likely to work Right. If you test for and treat the obstructive sleep apnea, mm -hmm. otherwise you may be back in the same situation as you were before the ablation if you don't do that. Right. And that's a very good point because I, I frequently tell this to, you know, in other articles when I talk to my audience, you know, there's, you know, when it comes to catheter ablation for AFib, you know, there are recurrence rates, you know, people are like, well, does it work? Does it cure AFib? You know, and I, and I tell people, you got to have a short-term plan and a long-term plan. Yes a catheter ablation may improve symptoms for AFib, but then in the long term, if you don't address the things that cause the AFib to begin with, it's inevitably going to come back. And that can include sleep apnea, that can include obesity, you know, and there's several of these risk factors which end up making AFib worse. It's going to come back if they're not addressed. And treating uh, sleep, apnea, uh, sleep apnea with a CPAP, you know, has shown to have significant improvement in AFib symptoms. I've seen some studies that said like 42% reduction in AFib symptoms. And then also the studies have shown that getting a procedure done, if you're compliant with sleep apnea treatment, then you get, end up getting better results. You know, surprisingly with all of this, uh, you find, we find that still that it's under-tested. Uh, sleep apnea is still under, despite no many people knowing the association between AFib and sleep apnea, it's still being under-tested and under-diagnosing people with AFib. Yeah, so a lot of primary care doctors are not thinking about testing in, in certain populations, especially people who are relatively thin. Mm -hmm. uh, these folks can have sleep apnea too. Um, the average physician gets one hour of training in sleep medicine in the mm -hmm. four years of medical school, if you can believe it. Yeah. It's crazy. Um, and then amongst cardiologists, it's variable, the, the uh, awareness of this association. Of course, you know, because this is your sub specialty, but I'll tell you an anecdotal story um, that illustrates what can happen. I was uh, a neurology resident out in Los Angeles. I came home to Massachusetts to uh, visit with my family for Thanksgiving and took, took like a real red eye flight. It came in and my family woke me up at six in the morning. I said, Hey, your dad is, is not feeling well. My dad mm -hmm. was just sort of sitting on the edge mm -hmm. of the bed, like not looking too well. And I said, what's wrong? He, he couldn't really articulate what was going on. I checked his pulse and it was just all over the place. Mm -hmm. Irregularly irregular. We go, mm -hmm. I said, Hey, that's it for Thanksgiving. We're going yeah. to the ED. And, um, 
cardiologist comes in, they do an EKG. Sure enough, he's an AFib. Right. Cardiologist, and this is before I really knew about the association. Mm-hmm. I was just a neurology resident. Yeah. Cardiologist, first couple of questions were, how much alcohol do you drink? Mm-hmm. How much caffeine do you take? Mm-hmm. Uh, has your thyroid been tested? Is it normal? Mm-hmm. And do you, do you snore? Yeah. So this guy was very, and I was like, right. oh, so that was really kind of like the, the dawn of understanding for me about, mm-hmm. about that. So it's been something I've been very aware of in my practice too. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, you can, you know, probably the most common traditional risk factor for having sleep apnea is obesity. You know, kind of people talk about like that wide, short neck, you know, and that's kind of right. more common probability of people having, um, sleep apnea, but you're probably seeing it more and more in people either younger or people who are not overweight. And so kind of what are, how much prevalence are you seeing in these people who don't have that most common or thought of risk factor to have sleep apnea? So there are a number of risk factors that have to do with genetics. So mm-hmm. about a third of your composite risk for having obstructive sleep apnea is purely genetic. It has to do with your facial and jaw structure that you inherited from your mm-hmm. parents. So if your mandible is on the smaller side or set back, or you have a more flat face, mm-hmm. that means that you have, so my face is really, it comes out. So I've yeah. got a lot of space back here. So I'm relatively protected from obstructive sleep apnea, but some people are, are flatter through here, or have a, a smaller jaw, often they use a beard mm-hmm. to cover mm-hmm. up their mandible. Mm-hmm. We call it the beard, positive beard yeah. sign in, in uh, sleep medicine. So these folks can have it too. You often see people that have um, uh, malocclusion, their, their teeth are very jumbled up, or they mm-hmm. have, have a lot of teeth removed as kids. Um, they, they have an overbite or overjet. Um, if you look in their mouths, they're their palates may go very high. So these folks just have uh, narrow jaws and that narrowness transmits to the back of the throat Mm -hmm. and predisposes them for the airway obstruction. Now, the other thing that a lot of folks aren't aware of, even the smartest cardiologists, uh, smartest primary care, is that there is a vicious circle here that the obstructive sleep apnea can contribute to the onset of AFib, but then the AFib can cause another type of sleep apnea called central sleep apnea. Mm, okay. And this is basically where the brain is forgetting yeah. to breathe. And people that have this, uh, they often don't have as much snoring, but their bed partners will say, oh, they, they make like puffing noises, like, mm, mm-hmm. and their breathing is kind of irregular. It sounds Sometimes they're breathing fast. Sometimes they're breathing shallowly. Mm -hmm. And and that may be central sleep apnea. So that is actually a very complicated thing to treat at times. And so the regular treatment of CPAP may not work great for those folks. So it's it's not uncommon for people with AFib to have both some obstructive and some central sleep apnea. When they're together, we call it complex sleep apnea. And we typically do want to try the, the CPAP first, but if you have a fib and you don't do well with CPAP, you don't tolerate it. You don't think it helps. You actually may need a bigger gun, a more comp, a more sophisticated machine to treat this issue. And that's what we're here. For. That's when it's time for a lifeline and time to speak to a sleep doctor. Right. So tell me a little bit about, you know, you know, kind of, it's relatively new to offer sleep apnea testing at home. I mean, maybe the last several years or so. Traditionally, you had to go to a sleep lab, you know, and kind of sleep there and get hooked up to machines, you know, like explain the the audience the difference between maybe what was previous versus now, what are more current offerings to get tested for sleep apnea? So the old school way was very old school. It hadn't changed much since the birth of sleep medicine, Mm -hmm. really in like the 60s, 70s, you had electrodes all over your head. They scrub your skin with uh, this abrasive and then apply these electrodes with paste all over your head, all over your face, Mm -hmm. your chest, your legs. And they create this massive wires into this big, it looked like something from some uh, superhero movie and tie it all together. And then 
you'd be in, in a, a sleep lab, probably mm-hmm. not a very comfortable bed. There'd be a camera with someone watching you. And frequently the technologist performing the study would have to come in and fix a wire, move it, replace it. Yeah. It's typically not on anyone's bucket list of things mm-hmm. to do. And what's, what's more, you're on their schedule and their staffing schedule usually means lights out somewhere between nine and 10 mm-hmm. PM. Well, most of us don't go to sleep that early and then okay. they're going to wake you up and kick you out by five, five thirty in the morning. Right. So for most people, that's going to thrash your day. You're going to be pretty tired and it can be very expensive for folks who, who don't have insurance or have a high deductible plan. Sometimes people get hit with bills up to $3,000 for these mm-hmm. studies. Wow. Yeah. And uh, you often have to wait weeks or longer to get in and then a week or more to get the results. And what we have now is um, a much more efficient, comfortable technology that is applicable for most folks. Still, it's recommended if you have very complicated medical problems like advanced COPD or heart failure that you do, or if you're looking for things like seizures or Mm -hmm. other rare things, sleepwalking disorders that you do an in-lab study, but the vast majority of people are appropriate for home sleep apnea tests now. So these tests are a much more stripped down version that you can do in your home on your time when you want. And I think that there's a strong argument that we get better data, more accurate results Mm -hmm. here because we're seeing you in your natural environment doing what you normally do, sleeping as close to how you normally sleep as possible. So these tests, the most common one is called a type three home sleep apnea test. And you use a nasal cannula to measure airflow. So this is like, looks like an oxygen Mm -hmm. cannula, then a belt on your chest that measures breathing effort, a finger oxygen probe. And then the brains of the unit sit on the belt and it measures your body position and Mm -hmm. records all the data. Mm -hmm. And that's it. And that's really all we need to be able to diagnose sleep apnea. Yeah. Well, that sounds a lot more convenient than going to a sleep lab. I've never had to go to sleep lab myself, but I would imagine if I had to go to an actual proper sleep lab and they hooked up everywhere, I probably wouldn't even sleep. You know, I would probably be so uncomfortable. It's not my normal environment. (laughs) I I hear that. Yeah. I hear that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Some people have crazy stories. Like I literally did not sleep for eight hours. And then they told me, uh, you don't, you, you, you have sleep apnea and and they're like, I didn't even sleep. How do they know? I'm I'm sure of it. So Yeah. 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 So obviously, you know, the main treatment for sleep apnea is the CPAP machine, you know, and there's been a lot of people that, you know, through my Facebook group or my patients in person who have had just tremendous results with, with CPAP treatment. But then there's also just as many people who say, I can't take it. I can't stand it. You know, the machine, that mask is too heavy for me, you know, and, and so people who don't have good compliance with it, or they, they don't really see a benefit from it because they don't really feel like it's comfortable enough for them. And so what are the main treatment options for CPAP these days? And what kind of alternatives are there for people who maybe aren't having good results from the traditional CPAP? So I like to tell people, if you pulled 100 folks who have tried CPAP, about two thirds will tell you that it was life-changing. They love it. They'll never sleep without it. A third will say they hate it. It was terrible. They'll never try it again. Now, of that population that failed it, and this is going to be high in the folks who are, who are your, part of your audience, um, a major reason for that is they got the wrong machine. They needed a more advanced version. So there are other advanced versions called BiPAP and ASV. Mm-hmm. ASV is one that treats obstructive and central sleep apnea directly. It's very common that I use that in patients with AFib and other cardiac Mm -hmm. issues. And for those folks who have a significant amount of the central sleep apnea, it, the CPAP may actually make it worse. So we often hear people complaining of the mask because that's a logical thing. They're aware of that, Mm -hmm. but the problem may actually be totally different than what the people suspect. It may mean, it may be that they actually need a different type of machine that works differently, but I want to clarify that to answer your question. What else is on there 
on the uh, treatment list besides these machines. There are um, devices that dentists make that you can wear. They're retainer-like devices that mm -hmm. pull your jaw yeah. forward and open up your airway that way. Um, there is a device called Bongo RX that fits in your nostrils. Mm -hmm. And when you breathe in, air goes right through this device. But when you exhale, some of the air is blocked, bounces back down your throat, helps to keep your okay. airway open. Um, there is a new uh, category of treatments, implantable devices. There's, there's one called Inspire, which is for obstructive sleep apnea. It's, it's, it's pretty extreme. It's uh, like a pacemaker that goes wow. in your neck with a, a lead, an electric lead to your uh, genioglossus, your tongue muscle, and you turn it on before you go to bed. And it stimulates wow. the tongue muscle to keep it firm and prevent it from falling back and uh, occluding your airway. And then there are a couple of, of those sort of devices for central sleep apnea mm -hmm. as well. There are surgeries. There's one surgery that used to be very popular called a U triple, triple P done by ear, nose, and throat uh, surgeons where they basically rotor rooter all the tissue out in the back mm -hmm. of your throat. Very popular until we got the long-term results back on the efficacy. Terrible. Only right. effective really in about 40 to 50% of people. Mm -hmm. And over time, that uh, effectiveness seems to go away. It can actually make the sleep apnea worse than you began over yeah. years and years. Um, there is a, a, a surgery that is very effective done by an uh, oral maxillofacial surgeon. It's called, uh, for short, the Bimax. And they, they break the upper and lower jaws and move wow. everything out about a centimeter. But that's extreme. Your yes, jaws are going to be wired extreme. shut for about wow. four to six weeks, drinking through a straw and all that. It will wow. change the way you look. Yes, too. that's crazy. That's definitely a few, a few options that I've never even really heard of before. But that's great information. How about for people who are obese, does weight loss actually improve or even eliminate sleep, sleep apnea? It, it can. It's a great question. One I get uh, frequently asked, but the best way to answer, to answer it is to cite the literature mm -hmm. that looked at morbidly obese people with obstructive sleep apnea who had weight loss surgery, and they rapidly lost a lot of weight. What we found is that the typical outcome was the people's obstructive sleep apnea got better, but it didn't go away fully. And this led to a theory that if you have obstructive sleep apnea for long enough, we now think that it leads to changes on the level of the brain where the brain seems to no longer be able to control the muscles of the mm -hmm. upper throat well. And it's sort of like a, a kindling effect. If you have this obstructive sleep apnea for, for long enough, then changes happen. It just potentiates it and it just never goes away. But I always encourage weight loss, lifestyle changes like avoiding alcohol, quitting smoking, um, avoiding sleep deprivation. Right. Um, those all can, can help. And I also recently was looking at those sleep medications that are over the counter sleep medications that also make sleep apnea worse. Yes and no. So there are some that are um, relatively safe and, and won't make it worse. The most common ones, yes, do make it worse. So not over the counter, but most commonly prescribed sleep medications, Ambien, Lunesta, um, Valium, Ativan, Clonopin, those all do have uh, both some degree of muscle relaxant properties, which will promote that airway mm -hmm. closure at mm -hmm. night, but also they prevent your brain from waking up. Mm -hmm. And so you may suffer more damage mm -hmm. from the closed airway before you, you yeah. wake up and open up your airway. The over-the-counter drugs, not going to uh, negatively affect sleep apnea, but negatively affect your sleep. Things like uh, the most common uh, over-the-counter drugs have um, Benadryl right. in, in them. And Benadryl, diphenhydramine, it um, prevents you from having as much deep restorative sleep. It keeps you in lighter stages of sleep. So it's very common to wake up and, and feel groggy or like yeah. kind of a hungover feeling yeah. after you take one of these. It'll put you to sleep and keep you to sleep, but you won't feel great the next right. day. Right. Now, mel melatonin is another common over-the-counter one. This is not going to have a negative impact 
on sleep apnea may help you fall asleep a little bit uh, more, more quickly too. It's not a panacea. It doesn't make your sleep amazing. What we know right. from the research is you're going to fall asleep a little bit easier. It looks like maybe eight minutes quicker than right. without it. it. It can be effective in certain other sleep disorders too, like circadian rhythm problems, jet lag, and mm -hmm. uh, situations where people fall asleep too early or too late. And it really affects their life. Sometimes we use melatonin in those situations mm -hmm. as well. So Dr. Cranny, you founded your company Singular, Singular Sleep. Uh, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about, you know, why you founded it and, you know, what are the services that, that you can offer? Yeah. So at the time I was doing a fair amount of telemedicine in neurology. It was a really burgeoning field. We were um, helping rural centers and under, under uh, staffed areas uh, with stroke uh, where people didn't have a neurologist on hand um, and helping helping local docs deal with stroke. And, and it hit me, you know, this is working okay. It's, it's still kind of pro problematic. It's hard to do a neurological exam on someone 3000 miles away, mm -hmm. but what this would be perfect for is sleep medicine, because I don't have to examine anyone. You, every diagnosis in um, sleep medicine is made clinically often with a sleep study mm -hmm. in, in addition to it, but it's, it's talking to people. Right with the results of the sleep study. So we can do all of that remotely, just like you and I are, are talking now. And then we, I had the idea, well, we can send people these sleep study kits. They can do them at home. It's pretty easy. And then they can meet with me, go over the results. Uh, we can come up with a treatment plan and I can prescribe and, and, and manage them completely remotely. And so another part of that was um, trying to make it a one-stop shop we became, uh, the practice also became a DME, a durable medical equipment company. So we actually sell, uh, dispense and manage the uh, CPAP and other related machines, mm -hmm. which is awesome because the newest generation of machines allow us to remotely monitor right. and manage the machine. So we can get the data through the cloud and also adjust the pressures over time to the best pressures for the people completely remotely. So we like to say you can do it all from home. You never have to leave your home. Right and get your sleep apnea treated. Now, there's actually a couple, and we talked about this a few weeks ago, but there's a couple of companies out there that do something a little bit similar in terms of having a online, you know, can order sleep apnea testing, but yours is a little bit unique because you offer your own kind of consultation, you're, li you're licensed in the grand majority of states in the United States. So tell a little bit about what's unique between singular sleep and maybe other online options to do this. So we started in 2015. So we were the first... Okay. To, to do this. And okay. we've got a lot of experience and we hope to, to be around. I think we're going to be around. Uh, once other uh, business minded folks saw this model, they thought, well, that looks pretty cool. So there, there are other options out there, but they're all, uh, none of them are headed by a doctor and they have a different sort of mindset. They're mostly oriented to how do we sell CPAP? machines. Mm -hmm. And my orientation like you is how can I best help people? Right. That's the, that's the goal here. I mean, number one, it, it's being a physician. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm oriented to trying to meet the patient where they're at and help them the best way possible. So mm -hmm. if they're totally adamantly opposed to some sort of treatment, then, okay, let's talk about this. This may help you a lot too. Mm -hmm. And we have a very comprehensive system. We, we basically run it like a, a traditional medical practice. So these other options, once you get the machine, probably that's it, they're yeah. ghosts. Uh, we are gonna be, we have the capabilities of, and we're the only one that can actually remotely monitor and manage you. So right. the, the way, you're supposed to manage sleep apnea is find the best pressure settings for the machine that fixes that individual's issue. The old school way of doing it was you'd have to go have a second sleep study yeah. after mm -hmm. the first one that diagnosed you with sleep apnea and find that best pressure. But now we have these machines that have auto adjusting capabilities. And basically we can do this at home, the proper way to go about it. We wanna get that same outcome as the in-lab study. We wanna find that one best pressure. The way we do it, is we start you off on auto adjust mode at basically the factory default pressure settings. 
let the machine do its thing. It's going to slowly adjust up and down, up and down. We're going to gather data. Then I want to see you back in about a month, month and a half to check on you. We're going to go over the data. I'm going to explain what it says. And then I'm going to make an adjustment to the machine mm -hmm. to dial it in for you. So to my knowledge, we're the only group out there that does this. Everyone else is just sort of like, here's your machine. Yeah. Good luck. So, you know, we're, we're in it for the long term. S sleep apnea is a chronic medical problem, mm -hmm. just like high blood pressure or type two diabetes. And it, it needs to be managed yeah. and checked on periodically. And, and that's our orientation. So I'd like to say we're the most medical outfit out there that does yes. home sleep apnea testing. Yes. You know, and I think that's a very important point for everybody to know is that this kind of long-term management and titration because you want to get the best results from CPAP treatment as well as for people who have AFib, you know, your best chances are of improving are if you're actually compliant with the CPAP therapy, you know, and obviously making adjustments, finding the right thing that works best for the individual patient is going to, is going to really make a big difference for people. And I'm really glad that you got, you offer the service compared to possibly other online services, which are a little bit more like, here's your CPAP, you know, good luck or, you know, but it's a, you know, having that individual care and knowing how to titrate things when needed is going to really give people the, the best results. So tell me about the cost or prices of these services. Is it usually covered by insurance or, or you know, what are the typical costs for people to expect for these services? So we are what would be considered an out of uh, network provider. We, we don't deal with insurance directly. And that was really something that was very important to me because um, eventually my, my traditional practice, I, I felt like I was being too hamstrung by insurance mm -hmm. with what I wanted to do. Like, oh, you have to get a prior approval for that, or you have to, you can't mm -hmm. get the ASV. You have to try the CPAP, make the person suffer for a few months, yeah. then have them go back and do another sleep study. Then we might consider giving them the machine that they actually need. So enough. Um, so we um, are uh, a cash-based practice. Um, we're very transparent about our costs. I think that's important. Yeah. The, the baseline home sleep apnea test starts at 295 during the COVID pandemic. We know everyone's, a lot of people have really been suffering financially. So we've got a discount on there now to kind of help people get started 10% uh, off. And then the... Um, Meeting uh, a consultation with me is $195. Um, if you do get equipment from us, a machine, then we're going to give you a credit of $100 from that consultation towards the machine, which, mm -hmm. is, which is pretty nice. And we sell the equipment at the lowest price that the manufacturers allow us to sell it for over the internet. So mm -hmm. pricing is really as good as as you can do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and it, everything you see, the prices up there of all the equipment, it's all mm -hmm. on our website, singularsleep.com. Yeah. And, and I think an important point that you brought up is that, you know, sometimes taking insurance is just hampers the way that you can deliver care, you know, and obviously, you know, you want to provide the best care possible and give the patients what they need. And sometimes insurances make it harder for doctors and patients as well, you know, and eliminating the middleman, you know, is, is, can be a very effective thing to get people the best care, especially when you're trying to help people all around the United States as, as well. You know, it can make things much more stream, streamlined for you and, and for the patient as well. Are there any, are patients able to kind of recoup any of those costs like through uh, HSA funds or anything like that? Yeah. So uh, everything we do is covered by HSA and, and FSA. Um, that's a common uh, thing. We also, um, get a fair amount of people that have uh, credit cards, healthcare credit cards, like uh, care credit. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we do have payment plans. Um, one's called Affirm. And uh, then PayPal has a, mm -hmm. a payment plan too, for people who, who need to space those okay. uh, payments out and for their finances. Okay. Um, we do assist people in giving them what are called super bills, which are mm -hmm basically a uh, detailed breakdown right. what the insurance wants of diagnostic and procedural code. So uh, if you do have insurance, you can uh, submit it and get it to count towards your deductible or mm -hmm. try to get reimbursed, whatever right. the policy is right. of, of your insurer. 
Yeah, I think a lot of times it more counts towards the deductible that they may have to pay, you know, but it's obviously these are good, very yeah, good options. So be aware a lot of, of, yeah, a lot of working Americans, probably the majority of people who have jobs and aren't being taken care of by the government are, are having high deductible plans. That was a way for companies to shift the burden more towards the, the insured. And so uh, people like me, we have a $6,000 deductible for each individual. And I think it's like 12 for our family. So uh, if I need a sleep study, I'm yeah. going to pay cash because yeah. the, the, if you go to a brick and if you go to, you know, a, a sleep doctor in the system or primary care, they're probably going to try to send you to an in-lab study still. That mentality is still mm -hmm there and, and there's various we can talk about that incentives to do that you know monetary incentives the more money can be generated for, for people doing that um and and so you know people are now more aware of how much stuff costs and yeah. it can be very hard to find out i mean before you jump in with both feet with a sleep study you yeah. you want to make sure you don't get hit with a three thousand dollar bill right so but it can it can be hard to pin that down before you actually do it uh, which stinks. Um, so that's one of the nice things about yeah. us. You know exactly what, what everything's yeah. going to cost. Exactly, exactly. Well, Dr. Crane, is there anything that we didn't discuss that you want to make sure that people really know about, whether it's your services or you know, so any topic that we didn't discuss during this interview? I think we, we really did a good broad uh, picture of, of what we're doing. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, we look forward to working with you um, uh, on this and through, through Dr. Um, you know, people identifying people, this may be a risk factor for, mm -hmm. for why you have uh, a modifiable risk factor, something right. you can do to help get out or stay out of AFib. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the machine, I will say one thing, the machines have gotten a lot more comfortable. Uh, the, the auto adjusting machines that we use are a lot more comfortable than the old fixed pressure machines that people used to get because what I to get a little bit more into the weeds what I typically do is put people on once we di titrate it dial it in for people I put them on a a specific range of pressures and that's more comfortable than one fixed pressure mm -hmm. because that fixed pressure usually was gonna cover you when you're on your back in REM sleep which is right. where you needed the most pressure right but when you're on your side you don't need that much pressure and okay. it may feel uncomfortable. Okay. So that definitely, uh, these auto adjusting machines that let us have a band of pressures definitely was associated with increased um, chance of success. So that's something else people who, who have, may have done this a long time ago should keep in mind, you know, things have evolved and the oh. masks have evolved too. There's many, many. So the old school full face mask, for example, if you were a mouth breather, you probably need a full face mask. They used to be this huge thing with a big forehead piece. Mm -hmm. And now some of them just go, they kind of seal under your nose and go over your mouth. They're okay. very small. So it's just an example of how things have evolved. Good. So uh, if you did good. this before you failed, you might want to take a look at it again. Okay. Yeah, definitely something for people to keep in mind. So I'll put a link uh, to your website together with this video, but why don't you let people know where they can find more about you and, and your company if they want to know about the services. Yeah, singularsleep.com is, is the main uh, place to, to connect with us. We do have a presence on, on Facebook. Um, we're not super active on uh, social media, but uh, yeah, feel free to call us at 844-SLEEP-WELL, uh, um, S-L-P-WELL. So that's 844 757 nine three five five or info at singular sleep.com email us there and again you pretty much provide services to the entire continent of the united states or is there yeah ev you... everywhere uh, i'm not licensed in north dakota delaware and hawaii okay so we don't take on patients from those states okay but anywhere else in the continental united anywhere states anywhere else okay. good to go well, Dr. Crane, I really appreciate you taking a few minutes of your time to educate my audience. And I really hope they'll take a look at your, your services because sleep apnea and testing and treatment are so vital for improving AFib as well. So take a look at singularsleep.com and I'll go ahead and put the link in the video as well. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you. You have a good rest of your day. Okay. Okay. Bye -bye. Take care.